I'm Timothy Deister, a third year medicine resident at UCSF. This is the five minute hospitalist on community acquired pneumonia. It's important to note that even though this video is covering clinical content, its intended use is for educational purposes only. Let's start off with our objectives. Today, we'll distinguish community acquired pneumonia or CAP from nosocomial pneumonia. We'll describe the clinical features, diagnosis and differential diagnosis for CAP. We'll list key features of clinical management for CAP. Let's start off with classification. Community acquired pneumonia or CAP, as its name implies, is acquired in the community. This distinguishes it from nosocomial pneumonia, which is acquired in a healthcare setting. The definitions for the classifications of pneumonia have changed over the years, but there are two important subcategories of nosocomial pneumonia for you to be aware of. First, hospital-acquired pneumonia, or HAP, which is characterized by onset of symptoms greater than 48 hours after admission. And second, ventilator-associated pneumonia, or VAP, which is characterized by onset of symptoms greater than 48 hours after intubation. We'll be focusing today on CAP and we'll start with its clinical features and diagnosis. CAP tends to affect older adults with multiple comorbidities, although of course it can affect younger persons and people with fewer comorbid conditions as well, and at times will follow a recent URI, although this clinical feature does not have to be present to make the diagnosis. The diagnostic criteria for CAP are the presence of appropriate symptoms and signs, as well as chest imaging revealing an infiltrate. In terms of appropriate symptoms and signs, these fall into pulmonary and systemic buckets. Pulmonary symptoms and signs include cough, sputum production, dyspnea, pleurisy, and hypoxia, whereas systemic symptoms and signs include things like fever, chills, and leukocytosis. The symptoms of CAP are important to know, as are their prevalences. In the left column of this table, we see four symptoms of CAP listed with the prevalence at the right. We see that cough is present in 90% of cases of CAP, followed by dyspnea and sputum production, and then followed by pleuritic chest pain. It's important to note a major caveat about this table though, which is that geriatric patients have fewer of the common symptoms of CAP, and so your clinical index of suspicion needs to be very high for CAP in elderly patients. In terms of the bugs that cause CAP, we'll focus on the ones that are most common in the inpatient setting. For patients who are admitted but not in the ICU, respiratory viruses, strep pneumoniae, mycoplasma pneumoniae, chlamydia pneumoniae, H. influenza, and Legionella species are the most common causes. For patients who are admitted in the ICU, strep pneumo, H. influenza, Legionella species, gram-negative rods, staph aureus, and respiratory viruses are common causes. The differential diagnosis for CAP is broad, and that makes it hard to come up with a short list, but some conditions that could mimic CAP include pulmonary edema, ARDS, lung cancer can at times be mistaken for CAP, pulmonary infarction, pulmonary embolism, ACS, as well as other causes. It's similarly important to remember that the differential for dyspnea is profoundly broad. It includes cardiac, pulmonary, metabolic, neuropsychiatric, neuromuscular causes, to name just a few big buckets. Um, and for that reason, it's difficult to come up with a short list. In terms of the initial management um, diagnostics, again, difficult because of the breadth to come up with a perfect approach, but there's a mnemonic I like to use called ACE with a two after the C. ACE reminds me to think about ordering an ABG, CBC, chest x-ray, or EKG in the presence of hypoxia. And each of these triggers me to think then of other tests. So with the ABG, I remember to think about whether in certain circumstances, a VBG would be acceptable as a substitute. The CBC reminds me to look for other labs like a BMP looking for AKI in the setting of emerging sepsis. The chest x-ray reminds me to think of advanced imaging. For example, if the chest x-ray is negative and there's no other cause identified, to think about ordering a CT chest and potentially a CTPE. And the EKG reminds me to think of troponins and BNPs, which could look for cardiac causes of dyspnea or could help evaluate for the presence of a significant PE. It's important to additionally consider some more tests. The sputum and blood cultures, viral panels, and special testing such as COVID-19 are what I'm referring to here. There are caveats to be aware of with sputum and blood cultures. 
Sputum cultures are only useful if they're collected in an appropriate manner, a high quality manner, and then delivered to the lab relatively promptly. So it'll be important at your institution to know how sputum cultures are collected and handled. They have a big role though in de-escalation of antibiotics when pseudomonas or MRSA is suspected, and so it's worth obtaining them if they're going to be high quality. For blood cultures, the yield in pneumonia is generally low, less than 10%, but they still can be helpful, particularly in persons who are presenting it with features of sepsis, and so that's a setting in which they're commonly used and certainly indicated. In terms of therapeutics, most, if not all, patients with CAP should be placed on CPO and monitored to maintain an SpO2 greater than 92% with supplemental oxygen. The mainstay of therapy for CAP is, of course, antimicrobials. The general approach here is to be familiar with the typical inpatient regimen, and then, if you have concern for pseudomonas, to modify it, and if you have concerns for MRSA, to add to it. We're gonna go through that now. This is a basic inpatient regimen for severe inpatient CAP. What you'll see is that the typical regimen has two drugs. One, a beta-lactam, very commonly ceftriaxone is used for this purpose, although there are many other options, including anthocyanin sylvactam. And then a second agent, typically from one of these two classes, or this third agent you see listed here. So macrolides, azithromycin being a very common choice for a second agent, the fluoroquinolones, and then doxycycline and tetracycline can also be used as a substitute as a second agent in this regimen. Let's talk about how to think about pseudomonal coverage. So the question that you should ask yourself is, are there pseudomonal risk factors? There are a couple of very important ones to be aware of. First, prior respiratory infection with pseudomonas is a very strong risk factor for reinfection and should prompt uh, coverage for pseudomonas. Then one of two other conditions, so either a hospitalization within the last three months where someone received IV antibiotics, or the person's just very sick, they're toxic appearing. If either of those are present, plus another feature suggestive of pseudomonas, like a recent stay in a long-term care facility, other use of antibiotics, structural lung disease, or immunosuppression, it's reasonable to think about covering for pseudomonas up front. The way to do this is to take the beta-lactam from your two-drug regimen and to substitute it for an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam. Options include piperacillin tazobactam, cefepime, and mirapenem. If the patient continues to worsen despite adding an anti-pseudomonal agent, that would be a reason to consider also adding a pseudom of fluoroquinolone. We refer to this as double coverage, and examples of this would be things like uh, levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin, which are both respiratory fluoroquinolones with anti-pseudomonal activity. If you're going to be pulling out these big guns, it's really important that you narrow as soon as possible based on your culture data. After you decide whether or not you need pseudomonal coverage, you should ask yourself if you need MRSA coverage. MRSA risk factors are similar. They are prior respiratory infection with MRSA, a strong risk factor that should prompt coverage, or again, presence of a hospitalization within the last three months where IV antibiotics were received, or the patient looks quite ill and has some additional suggestive features, such as that they're known to be colonized with MRSA, they've had recent flu since influenza is a risk factor for secondary pneumonia with MRSA, they're immunosuppressed, or they have evidence of necrotization on imaging. In this case, you will add a drug to your two-drug regimen, either vancomycin or linazolid. And again, you'll want to narrow as soon as possible based on culture data since you're pulling out pretty big guns. In this case, the MRSA nasal swab, which is commonly available, can be quite useful and is quite predictive. If it comes back negative, it's appropriate to reduce coverage to not have MRSA coverage anymore. In terms of duration, the typical antibiotic duration is a five-day course. In some select cases, like the patient's not back to their baseline or they're still febrile at day five, we'll consider extension. And then it's super important, as I've already emphasized, to de-escalate your coverage based on culture data as it returns. This is a way to prevent us from developing antimicrobial-resistant bugs. So some takeaways. CAP is acquired in the community differentiating it from nosocomial pneumonia. CAP frequently presents with cough, sputum production, and shortness of breath, although as we said, in older patients, these features can be absent. Prior respiratory infections with MRSA or pseudomonas or a recent hospitalization or very sick patient with risk factors should change your thinking about empiric antimicrobials.
and the typical duration of antibiotics is for five days, although in select circumstances, the duration may be extended. I wanted to close by saying that I myself was a New Yorker for five years and have many, many people who I love and care about in the city, and to say thank you to all of the doctors who are going to help take care of that um, city that's so special in my heart. And I hope that this talk is a small contribution to your efforts. I wish I could be there with you.